Oh my um, god, Sam, what is wrong with you? you know, normal things that everybody does. Well, that yeah. made it, honestly, though, that made it affordable. That made it so that I could afford <laughs> That's to run awesome. this, you know? Dude, the amount so of time you spent rewriting that TLS library cost you more than that freaking compute power ever would. Uh, I don't know. I was, I was scanning the entire internet for like 20 bucks a month. Like, it was nothing. Hey guys, check this out. There's a bug bounty program right now that is paying 6.25 times its normal bounty amounts. It's brand new and the scope is so massive that there's practically a 0% chance of dupes. And it's a white box testing environment, so you've got access to source code. This is a bug hunter's dream come true and it's the WordFence bug bounty program. Get this, the scope for this program is every single WordPress plugin above 50K installs. So there's thousands of plugins already and it's expanding every single day. It's a crazy opportunity and the team knows it's frankly a little crazy. So they had to put a cap on the number of reports a researcher can have active at a given time and they capped it at five. But for you, the critical thinking listener, thanks to this sponsorship, you guys get 20 active reports at a time and you'll get an extra 10% bonus on top of your report when you mention critical thinking for your first submission to the WordFence Bug Bounty Program. So it's an amazing opportunity. Head over to ctbb.show slash WF, ctbb.show slash WF for WordFence, and get more information, submit some crazy bugs. I know you guys are going to crush it. All right, let's get to the episode. All righty, we got a super special guest today, Mr. Sam Erb. Welcome to the podcast, man. Hi. Um, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, dude. <laughs> That's great. Well, thanks for coming on, man. And I appreciate you listening. I do I do know that you do listen because you'll ping me from time to time and, and talk about stuff uh, from the pod. So definitely, definitely appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, this is, this is on my rotation, you know, and I'm like doing dishes or showering. I don't know. <laughs> listen to this. <laughs> showering. Yeah. The, the best time. <laughs> um, That's true. You got to get those, sh those shower thoughts in, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. It, it's actually been really cool too. you know, that that because we've I think uh, I almost said Shopify, Spotify has been coming out with those, uh, you know, like, what is it? 2000 yeah, the wrapped, wrapped uh, yeah. Yeah, thing. And people have been like, oh, you know, we listen to critical thinking all the time, you know, top whatever percent listeners. So definitely, definitely appreciate that. Um, yeah. So, so I guess normally at the beginning of this podcast, we will go into like little history of Sam, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, but I think we're going to skip that this time and we're going to come <laughs> back to it later. And we're just going to jump right into some hacker methodology stuff. Okay. So, Cause so just for, okay, all right, I'll do a little context. All right. There's a little context. Tell, tell um, the people who we're talking to. All right. So th this is, this is Sam Merv, currently Google employee, uh, hacker extraordinaire, one of my top respected hackers, uh, and one of the most influential hackers in, in my life, as far as, um, you know, methodology and like, uh, I guess hacking techniques that I respect, uh, as far as that goes. So Sam, really happy to have you here. Um, and, and I kind of want to dive a little bit into what makes you, um, so special as, as a bug bounty hunter and a hacker. And my theory is that that is largely coming from a background that is not related to web security. Right. Um, so talk to, talk to me a little bit, cause you, you were a low level, I guess you were doing low level development, right? Uh, in the beginning, or was it always security? You know, I know you were working with stuff that was not web, web related. Yeah, so it's always been web tangential, I think is the best way mm. to describe it, um, yeah. and security tangential. But I have spent a decade as a developer. Um, yeah. So I worked at uh, Cisco for a few years doing uh, crypto hardware integration. Yeah, so th this is exactly the shit I'm talking about. <laughs> like crypt crypto hardware integration, yeah. uh, you know, like a question. Um, okay, so so I guess I, I want to hear about that, and we're gonna we're gonna hear about that. But what what I really want to get to is why 
is this whole concept of going wide and versus going deep. And I, I, I categorize hackers by this, right? And you hear me talk about this on the pod all the time. You are very much a go deep sort of hacker by my estimation. Um, and so I want, I'm wondering, is that a, do you think that's a function of, you know, having spent so much time at a lower level that you're more comfortable at the lower level, so you try to get down lower and lower and lower and lower? Or, um, you know, is that an intentional decision made by you? Uh, that's a really good question. I. I think there is a certain amount of like I, I am comfortable going and reading an RFC and then you know applying that somewhere and trying everything that I can find in the RFC. Um, mm. But at the same time, it's you know I, having been a developer, it's like you you kind of you know what mistakes to, like to me anyways. It's you know what just makes mistakes developers make, and then you can go and. Uh, find those mistakes in the wild. <laughs> mm. And, mm. you know, on the, the security engineering side of that, it's like, how do you prevent those mistakes from happening um, or build frameworks that don't allow them? Um, but yeah, I mean, you've seen it. It's, it, you know, there's 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 been a lot of instances where like, I think that there should be a bug there and, you know, I will spend, you know, 10 hours going off and reading an RFC, <laughs> which is just like, it, you know, completely, it's not the healthiest thing in the world, but it's like once you get fixated on something that might be vulnerable, then like it's hard to think about other things. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. Do, do you think that like also your engineering sort of like background has pushed you to be more of a like a technical hunter uh, rather than sort of like that black box hunting? Like I, I think a lot of the hacking that I've seen you do sort of is diving into like how does the source code for this work or like reading through like the sort of the, the more... Um, Open, open source sort of sort of approach and do you feel like your engineering side has really pushed you in that direction and as well yeah absolutely like i i want to understand how the systems work to break them um the story that i tell actually a lot is like this was at like a one of the u.s government live hacking events um mm. somebody from the u.s government was like you know asked me and a few other hackers is like you know how do you guys avoid the dark side? You know, like, <laughs> how, do you stay, how do you stay good hackers? And I was, right. I personally, I was so offended by that because like all I want to do is go and figure out how these systems work and break them. It's like, I don't really care what your social security number is, you know? It's... Yeah, yeah. No, that, how do you that, not, that makes sense. Yeah, how do you not commit credit card fraud? What's going on? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm like, well, maybe, maybe that's what you want to do. And like, that's, you know, yeah. I, but that's not why I'm here. <laughs> Yeah, no, and and I think that speaks largely to the curiosity motivated mm -hmm. aspect uh, of, and, and I think that's one of the things that makes you a really a really great researcher and a really great book bounty hunter. But it does come with that downside, like you mentioned, of like, all right, I'm gonna read this thing till my eyes bleed, you know, and like, and and try to figure out, you know, never letting go of a bug, especially you know if you can't figure out if you can't explain everything in the situation. Um, yeah, I um, I love the term. Uh... Accidentally secure. Yeah. Because there's things that I'll come across. I hate where, that like, term. <laughs> I, know I, I love it, but I hate it. it yeah. <laughs> I know things are broken in some way, but in bug bounty context, you can only report things that are valid. You know, you can't report yeah. like half a bug, really. Well, you could, but you'd get. Yeah. yeah. So, so along that line, like, how, how do you go about sort of thinking about bugs when, when you're, when you're approaching a problem and you want to like really deep dive and like find sort of the most impact? What is like? What is your thought process? I honestly, and I, I think you guys have seen this at um, some recent events. It's like I'm really interested in looking for locations where um, uh, you can get the highest CVSS score. I think it's the best way to describe it. Like mm -hmm. looking for those unauthenticated places with, um, you know. Networks not authenticated, no privileges required. Um, mm -hmm. You know, get aim for that CVSS 10.0, and avoid mm -hmm. the places where like you you can't possibly get that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I, I hate to say it, but like mobile apps come to mind. Um, yeah. <laughs> wow! But, wow! Yeah. Shots fired. <laughs> but no, at the same so, time, like mobile apps should have a separate, in my opinion, anyway, it should be rewarded yeah. differently. Like, yeah. To no, totally. I totally agree. We, we we actually had this problem recently as well, where, where we were trying to award a, a mobile vulnerability and try and figure out how to score it. And like, if you go traditional CVSS, you run into all these problems where it's like, you know, like adjacency is like physical or is like yeah. local, yeah. right? It's like, it's really like, it's very, very difficult um, to score in the same way. But like, do you 
do you actually approach it like from a CVSS perspective, like purely do you just go sort of like, okay, like if I were to think about this from CVSS, like what parts of the app should I avoid? Or is it, is it more sort of like high level? I mean, to be fair, that's a lot where I'll start. Okay. Um, mm. You know, mm. from there, I'll kind of like work my way down. Um, yeah. But it's, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, it's like we're, we're all trying to like as bug hunters anyways, we're trying to maximize reward and, yeah, that's right. how we do it. <laughs> well, and 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 it's like you know, this kind of reminds me of of a talk I gave a while back on um you know open source methodology on the when I was talking about the Grafana bug at NahamCon. It's this concept of like, okay, I've got this goal, you know, and I I need to. I need to work back from where, you know, it, let's say I want to submit a, a you know, a 10.0 C- CVS but as bug, right? It was, which we all do in, in bug bounty and also specifically in live hacking events. Then you've got to start naturally from the spots where it's possible for you to get a, you know, a, a 10.0 CVS as bug, right? So it, it makes more sense to, to focus on the unauthenticated context. And actually I had a little bit of a, a of a question here is it seems to me like in, in, um, in the uh, life hacking event that we collaborated on, I'll, I'll say it, but we're gonna have to bleep it. Um, that, uh, you know, you focused a lot on authentication there and you focused a lot on authentication at the last couple of life hacking events that I've seen you on. Is that, would you say that's your bread and butter? I mean, wh- where, where, do, where does that play a role in your testing? You know, I always say it's where I'm gonna start. And really? I just often never move on. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's a lot of the truth to it. It's like, I'll spend like, you know, that's next thing great. I'll know is it'll be like 20, 30 hours later. And I'm like, I'm yeah. still trying to figure out all the, all the pieces and um, understand how they all mesh together. So yeah. when you find yourself down like a rabbit hole like that, do you find it's more that just like you've, you've sort of stumbled into the fact that the app is more complicated than you initially realized? Or do you keep coming up with like new, more creative scenarios that you have to sort of suss out and see if they're, their you know viable viable vulnerabilities i mean it's a little bit of both but like you know listening to kind of going back to like listening to this podcast while i'm like doing other things Mm. like Mm. there's a lot of times where you know i'll spend like an entire night just looking at like in a single like a single piece of the application and then you know go and brush my teeth and be like oh i'm an idiot you know Mm -hmm. Mm. i need to go back there and try these things i didn't quite realize this is how they all fit together. And um, yeah, that's often led to my best bugs. <laughs> so mm-hmm. so it spends, you know, it seems like, uh, you know, to use the technical terms is funny because my wife always gets on my case, you know, for using technical terms for like <laughs> non-technical things. But it's almost like, you know, you've got like a, you know, like a, a like um, uh, what's the oh a screen you know like in the terminal you know like it's it's running in the back of your brain you know just like all right let me just screen detach from that right and uh, and it's just running back there like processing 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 and um and and I think you see that with a lot of of top bug bounty hunters is like even if you're walking away you know from the screen when you're doing stuff like brushing your teeth or like changing your clothes or like you know you're thinking you're thinking you're in that mode. Um, and it gets overwhelming, right? Like that's something that that really takes a lot of a, a lot of the parts of your life. And as somebody who's not a full time bug bounty hunter, somebody who has a full time job, um, I'm wondering how you you manage that, you know, with your full time job and with bug bounty, and like, you know, how how does that affect your life? And how do you segment bug bounty from these other things to? Because it kind of like tries to take over sometimes. I think. I mean, it's a really good question. I to be honest i don't do it i don't do too much bug bounty work anymore um i used to participate in every life hacking event and like you know as um you know my my partner was off uh finishing off her phd for a while and that just Mm. gave me a little bit more free time um because she was off finishing that and so um you know really since then i've had significantly less time from that um i will Mm. say though it's like for me anyways, it was most challenging to not associate time spent elsewhere with like a dollars per hour. Um, like yeah. you have to be really careful. Like once you start doing this with any consistency, you start getting paid with any consistency that you don't yeah. associate your time with an hourly rate. Cause all of a sudden, like, and honestly, to be clearly honest, I still have a lot of trouble just sitting down watching TV. Like, yeah, that's just the challenge. Totally. Because like, uh, I'll start thinking like, oh, hey, like, 
Yeah, I actually, I call this, um, I call it like, it's almost like a metronome in the back of my head. That's like, you know, tick, tick, tick. So I call it like a tick yeah. almost like, yeah, yeah. why are, you know, you should be doing this. Like, why are you hanging out with your friends? You should be mm-hmm. going and making money. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like to have, you have to, to me anyways, it's important to not even try and calculate that because <laughs> mm, once i start yeah. going down that route it's it, it can well, really drive me to negative a, outcomes it's a slippery slope yeah, for sure exactly. you know we talked about it you know on the episode a little bit with douglas with douglas day with archangel um and he you know he was saying yeah like now i'm try- trying to find it hard to like justify uh, you know going out with my friends instead of staying home and hacking you know yeah. it, when you have this essentially unlimited access to trade your time for for money that's not really limited and sometimes it's like huge amounts of money too. i mean to be fair it's a good problem like it's a very privileged problem to have <laughs> it is it is um, and and and, but, and i'm grateful for it but you know when you swing it the other way it's a little bit you know it becomes destructive um yeah, and so it I, it, it's yeah. hard for bug bounty hunters to to regulate that for sure um definitely a pitfall to be aware of. So so jumping back to the the, the hacking methodology thing, mm-hmm. I'm wondering, you know, being a deep diving hacker, I kind of get crap all the time uh, from the community for like, yeah, you know, I'll spend like three weeks, four weeks on a program, you know, before I like move on. I'm wondering, I'm looking for some validation here. <laughs> no, uh, how long do you spend on a program and how long do you, uh, how deep do you dive? You know, it also, again, let me caveat that question though, because I know that, you know, the brain works a little better for Mr. Sam or compared to, to me. So it may not take you quite as long to, to get through a target, but. I have, I don't know. So when it comes to life hacking events, especially, I will look at mm. that target, nothing but that target for oh, yeah. that time period and then just stop yeah. completely. Um, yeah. For other targets, I will actually come back to them, especially targets that I'll submit a bug and they'll react to it quickly. Like that's been my test. It's like, if I submit a bug, they react to it quickly. Like, okay, like this, this team isn't going to have like too many uh, duplicates sitting around for me to mm-hmm. find. Um, they're quick to respond, which means like I can go and submit other things and not not be worried that they're going to like I don't know maybe not pay me or something, for example. Um, sure. But honestly, there've been very few product targets that I've like really stuck with. Um, Airbnb was one that I um, that I think we. We actually participated in that life hacking event together. <laughs> yes, we did, Sam. Yes, we did, uh, and that, I, that's that I, behind me. Yeah. I took, yeah, okay, I took <laughs> first at that event, but somehow somebody else got the belt. So, <laughs> love that. <laughs> um, no, we'll dive into yeah, that sorry, later. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, continue, sorry. continue. Um, but, uh, Airbnb was one where it's like I, I found that I really liked how their application worked and, mm-hmm. um, you know, so I, I did the extra step there. I even automated everything that I could. Um, and I really stuck with that for years until they made some like pretty high level, they actually wrote a whole engineering blog post on, on this. And it was like more of like an engineering change, but it also resulted in like a really positive security outcome where like all of their security became much more centralized and really less, uh, bug prone. That's the best way to describe it. Um, Dude, can you talk a little bit about that? Like now that the blog post is out, can you talk about some of the details of what they changed and, and well, this is, how? This is entirely from an outside perspective. Like I don't know yeah. the like, you know, insider of details course. of any of this, obviously. Um, yeah. But, you know, they, without, I'm trying to like not talk about bug reports, sorry. Um, <laughs> You're good. Uh, they centralized, seemingly centralized it, it, a lot of their, oh, sorry, good. Yeah. It, well, it, for what it's worth, if you want to talk about some bug reports, we, we can always like cut it out and bleep it later. So yeah, if it, that just makes it easier. Yeah. Oh no, it's all good. I, I really think like what it comes down to is like they really centralized their, um, off management and that really like putting that all into one place and like centralizing control of all of their API endpoints um, mm. really mm. led to, it was really, it seems like it was more of an engineering decision, you know, like it probably led to good engineering outcomes, but sure. the side effect was like, you didn't have teams going off and making their own APIs with the same mistakes over and over again. Um, so you know, that, so after that, I kind of stopped. <laughs> what is the, so? What does that mean, Sam? Like, like if we were to if we were to take it a little another layer, you know, clearer, is that saying okay? You know, they implemented some middleware that sits in front of all the a- API endpoints that implements you know their access control stuff, and all of the IDORs disappeared, or are uh, yeah, we talking roughly. about off? I mean, is that is that really <laughs> yeah, what we're talking about? Okay, yeah. 
Yeah. So like, I, yeah, I, I don't want to get read into through that one, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, we can say that I Airbnb had idors. You know, it's not that that's not the end of the world. Um, no, and that that's big. You know, and, and so when you see a giant change like that, you know, that changed the way that you interacted with that with that program. Um, yeah, substantially. I mean, it's, it's a good security outcome for them. Um, you know, we're obviously, uh, you know, we're 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 both simultaneously like security driven, but we're also monetarily driven. So it's yeah. like, yeah, it obviously it resulted in me getting paid less money, but it also means Airbnb more secure. <laughs> so, so how long did you spend on that program? Uh, oh, I mean, I automated everything I could. Um, probably fifty to hundred hours. Okay, um, and, and is that over the course of? Six months? Is that over the course of a couple of weeks? No, a few is months, that over the, yeah. A few months, yeah. okay. And what does automation for that sort of thing look like? Everything was custom. Um, you know, I was I was writing custom parsers for their JavaScript to pull out API endpoints, testing those API endpoints. Um, mm. I, were you automatically testing the API endpoints or were you alerting on them then manually text on well, the testing? Usually them? just manually alerting, to be fair. Yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was, there was some automation there. Uh, then there was also... Um, I've gone through a series of like revisions of my own like recon architecture, mm -hmm. um, some of which yeah. I ended up open sourcing. Um, but uh, I, that was I don't all. Think I saw that. Was that on your GitHub? Uh, I don't actually know if I ever. Uh, well, I mean, part of it was that was the whole like DNS grep thing. Ah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. DNS grep, yeah, 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 of course. Um, so that's just like, you know, you can take advantage of uh, you know DNS is hierarchical. You can mm. search mm. it really easily based on that. Um, as long as you pre-sort it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask, so like two things on that one, you mentioned that you wrote like very custom automation. Um, obviously that's a little bit easier when you have a software engineering background, but <laughs> it, it, was that something sort of like that you decided to do because you were spending a lot of time on Airbnb or do you do that for every program or like what, oh, what, it, what, what made you do that? I freaking probably wrote it in C. <laughs> <laughs> To be fair, I was using like four languages, but yeah, <laughs> no C in there. What? <laughs> Why I'm, not, I'm not, I don't even want to know. Get, it, get out. <laughs> get, you're off the pot. Yeah. <laughs> not allowed. Oh, jeez. Um, no, I just, you know, I try to use the right thing for the right purpose. Like, you know, I, I string everything together with Bash, but like where I need to, I'll drop into like Golang to just get things faster. And Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not quite at rest yet, but I'll get there eventually. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, <laughs> few of us are. Yeah. Um, no, that, that makes sense. And actually, JS monitoring is something that we've been talking about a lot in the you know critical thinking community mm -hmm. lately. And there have been some really cool solutions that are coming up around it, and uh, it's it's exciting to see. And you know, you were kind of ahead of the of the curve on this industry. You know, doing this back in what? I mean, when did we compete at that event? Was that 2018? Might have been 2019. Yeah. 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 yeah 2019, like maybe. Um, so, you know, wh what was that? I mean, let, let me just try to break it down technically. So yeah. you would you would reach out to the you know uh, HTML page, pull out the JavaScript file hash, go to that. JavaScript file, would you beautify it or would you just run regex on it? Or were you, were you doing diffs of, of the code directly or were you doing diffs of like the strings in the code? How did that look? Um, if I recall correctly, it was like a I think webpack is the right term to be using there. Yeah. They, yeah, so yeah. I would, uh, reach out to Airbnb, pull out the webpack. Uh, mm. They followed, and I, once again, this is pushing the list of my Yeah, it's a little bit. It's, um, it, they would, it's a little farther back too. Yeah. So. Too, yeah. yeah. Um, they would, uh, Follow a very common format mm -hmm. for their API endpoints in that webpack, mm -hmm. even though it was somewhat minified, um, yeah. which you could then pretty straightforward to extract that. And yeah, I mean, from there, it's all just like Discord notifications, like, hey, there's this new thing. And, uh, you know, it's it's a really easy way to, when you, when you know a program well, it can become a very easy way to find bugs. Because um, yeah. as soon as something launches, you can just be like, okay, I'm just going to go test it, you know, and you're off to the first one there. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, this is what the pros are doing, you know, when you're, when you're going long-term, going deep on a program. Mm -hmm. And and that actually makes me think a little bit for, uh, you know, more, obviously you were sort of taking notes with code in this scenario, right? You were, you were saying, okay, I've noticed this structure in the JS file mm -hmm. on how these API endpoints are, you know, done. I'm going to write some code to automatically parse all this and, you know, uh, help me see this in a better way. But I'm wondering what kind of notes do you take for yourself 
in general, are you like a, you know, whatever, astiff.txt sort of guy? Or are you like, a, I've got this whole Postman built out with their whole API spec sort of guy? Uh, Where on the yeah, spectrum? Yeah, I, I, did, I did hear that in the last episode. That's, that's why. <laughs> yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> for, for me, I actually take, I have like a, a pretty standardized format at this point for recon. Mm. I think all my recon is up in its own folder. Everything is very, very neat there. I can even diff it between like runs mm -hmm. um, to see what's Great. new. But when it comes to like looking at the application itself, no, I yeah, I'm a readme.txt guy. Like, yeah, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> next so time, that, that... next time I hack on this .txt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, what do you think about that though? Like, just out of curiosity, you know, uh, we all have the things that we do, you know, because we that's just how we do it. Yeah. But but do you think it'd be more optimal for you to take time to 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 write you know more thorough notes, or do you think that would interrupt the creative process or what? I think it, you know, I think it really depends. Like, I think it, like, uh, to use the Airbnb case again, like, mm. I think, like, if I were to spend more time on that program, then, yeah, I would absolutely have taken much more structured notes on that. And I have a lot of respect for the folks who do. And, like, I don't know. That's something I wish I could, or I should get better at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's definitely room for growth. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought I had structured notes, and then even even still, I've seen some other people who have like way, way more yeah. structured notes that I'm like, I'm looking at theirs and I'm like, dang, that's, <laughs> I, I need to make some improvements. And then every time I go back to mine, I'm like, uh, this would be a lot better if I, if I had, you know, X, Y, and Z, but, um, mm. this is one of those things that is, is sometimes it's a real big time investment. And, uh, depending on like what your workflow looks like, like if it's not like a bump in your workflow, then oftentimes it's just better to just, you know, keep it simple and, yeah, I think it was. I think it was the, uh, the interview with Franz, which mm. like I don't know. You know. I feel kind of honored to have to go in after him. <laughs> like a little Star Trek. Big kind of, shoes to fill. You know, right? <laughs> um, but uh, he he talked about how he was like uh, you know taking taking notes of like parameters used and stuff. And it's like I almost wish I had even like a whole another layer of structured recon because um, mm. usually I. Uh, for the most part, anyways, I tend to stop with like subdomain enumeration a little bit past that, but like not too much. Mm. And like, I really think that there's so much that could be added there um, that would, you know, at the end of the day, just like make make the bug hunter's life easier, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of uh, extra layers you can go down deep, and when you get start getting diminishing returns, I, I don't know. And it actually yeah. makes me makes me think of this this topic, um, this sort of hypothesis that I've been kind of thinking about lately because you know us three we've all been successful in bug bounty and you know when you start building a discord community like we are at critical thinking you get a lot of people being like hey you know this is what I want to do can, can you help me get there and I and we don't have time to answer all the questions but um, I, it, it has made me think more about how to framework eyes what I do right and, and how to like take away life lessons from something that I just kind of do intuitively, right? Um, and one of the things that came to my mind is I wonder whether bug bounty hunting can be minimized to, or, or simplified, I guess, to number of attack vectors tried. Like, I, I wonder if, if there was a way for us to optimize our hunting for just raw number of attack vectors tried, whether that would be close to the optimal path to produce, uh, you know, bugs as the result. Like, like, am I am, am I off base yet? What do, I, I, I think you're off base. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Lie. That's great. <laughs> no, that's thing. good. 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 I love day it. Would just would just dominate that chart, right? Or right. You know, like, right. The, the what? The like what would dominate that chart? Zero day or like an inch next zero day. Oh yeah, right. no, no, no. Yeah. I, no. I mean, like, well, what do what do you mean by that? Because I mean, like, okay, you know, I'm gonna try if I can do this IDOR on this one endpoint. No, yeah. okay, and, you know, I'm gonna do try to do this, you know, uh, C surf over here. You know, like the more attack vectors I'm trying, the more likelihood one of them is gonna work, right? And and so, but I guess this is sort well, of like a no. approach. No, 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 no. Right, no this is a right, gambler's fallacy right here. Okay. All right, hit me. <laughs> the hit more me, attack vectors you try, the equally uh, likely they are for for them to pop. Okay, it's a flip of a coin every single time. No, <laughs> There's no guarantee. But it's not though. Like it's not really. It, well abstract like from a, abstractly yes there's no like every vulnerability has an equal chance of, of of occurring depending on the context and you with your intuition as a hunter you can determine right. what things are more likely yeah. that's right? what i'm talking and so about so i think that that's like like the, the real nuance is that the more that you've been hacking 
the more you're able to narrow, like quickly narrow down your scope of vulnerabilities that you're testing based on what you're seeing. Whereas theoretically, there's infinite possibilities, right? Like you, you could test infinite variations of eye doors and vulnerabilities in all different and parameters and, and everything and never yeah. hit anything because you're sort of blindly testing the wrong things when you mm. should be doing what you're doing, which is narrowly targeting it down. Mm. Yeah, and so I've actually, I've, this has like a lot of parallel with um, like binary reverse engineering. Mm. Um, and like the, the, the thing I've heard there anyways, is like, I, I'm not great at this myself, but like- We're gonna get some Sam Herb shit right now, dude. This is about to be- Well, once you figure out, uh, this is from, this is, I, I probably saw this on Twitter at some point, but like once you understand like what a printf function looks like, you know, mm. you see it and you can uh, cast it aside as like, this is a printf function. I don't need to look at this again. Yeah. Um, that absolutely happens in this industry. Um, you know, I know what this framework looks like, or I know this is a WordPress site. And I'm just going to cast it aside or look at extensions, and that's it. You know, for example. Um, mm, mm. But that first time you see something, it's like, yeah, you have to like put in the time to like understand it. And like going back to what you were saying, like looking for the um, trying to understand what the what the or what the quickest way is to find bugs. I really think like having a way to search or categorize your past reports would go a long way towards that. But then you have to have that catalog of past reports. Mm. Um, you know, and this it comes up with with me actually a lot with uh, um, XXC type bugs like that whole any any variant of an XXC. Um, over time, I've kind of built up like a catalog of like past reports, and it's like it's very easy to just go in there and find working exploits. But if you search mm. on the internet, it's, you know, they might work, they might not work, it might only work in certain contexts. Um, and so you kind of develop this catalog of things you found and therefore can just leverage that to go find again. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And, and specifically on targets, you know, like you mentioned with the Airbnb thing, I mean, some targets are just going to be vulnerable to the same thing over and over and over again, yep. just by nature of their software development life cycle and their, you know, inner culture decisions on how to do, you know, authentication and, and authorization and that sort of thing, right? Um, and so that's definitely good advice. And, and, and I guess what I mean a little bit, just going back to the whole volume of attack vectors sort of vibe, like, I don't mean to, I still think this methodology could be helpful for beginners because the, it's so easy to get lost in, in all the things you need to study, you know, and all the things you need to understand. And, and, but I really liked your, your, your scenario of like, we all needed to test a WordPress site, you know, a couple of times before we knew that, ah, the volumes are going to be in the extensions, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I don't know, it's kind of a hard thing to, to normalize because I feel like there should be some way to, you know, get the 80-20 rule out of this, right? Like, you know, like it, it, for us to be really thorough on a target like we are in the live hacking events, you've got to really go 100%. But in order to find 80% of the bugs, you know, with 20% of the effort, there should be some sort of algorithm that, that that should lead us down that path but it's not optimizing for attack vectors i can see because because th th that does make sense joel that you know you could just endlessly test a bunch of random things so i don't know it's hard to nail down yeah it's definitely a, it's definitely a tricky thing i think like a lot of different automation stuff has tried to sort of capture that where like um whether it's like the dns like a lot of that i'd say like 80 percent like probably maybe not 80 percent but maybe like 60% is like DNS recon, subdomain takeovers, like simple XSS is like vulnerable software that's been deployed that is online. Like there's a lot of that stuff that's just like easy, sort of low hanging fruit that all you have to do is find it in, in order to exploit it. Um, and then the rest is like sort of like authenticated testing, like having to go deep, having to like actually understand the, the, the relationships between different parts of the application and identify how you can you know leverage that or exploit it to to pop oftentimes the same types of bugs but just in a different context um mm. i don't know man i just think there's something to be said for volume as well you know like there's something to be said for okay you know i'm gonna just go and try all the things i can think of but maybe that's that's not the exact exact approach
All right. Well, let, let me let, let, let's move uh, along from a classic Justin tangent. There, I'll continue to keep on noodling on. I, how I know to I'm about to have a 30 minute debate with Justin about this after after. <laughs> he knows. He knows what's coming, man. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know. I feel like there should be some way, but Joel, we'll we'll save this for a uh, for a time when we can really uh, hash this one out. Okay. Um, so, one of the things that I that I wanted to ask, I guess. It's sort of tangentially related to the to the debate that we just had there on on how to optimize for bugs is it, do you think you and this is kind of a gut feeling I've been wanting to ask a bunch of the people that come on the pod how much of your time do you think you spend thinking about the bug versus actually testing something so let's say you've got a scenario where you're where you've got like a a bug you're trying to exploit right yep. do you often just sit back stare at the ceiling think about the bug or do you are you constantly iterating and trying new things and brute forcing this and you know that sort of thing if you had to guess what would your ratios be of between those two it's really terrible honestly so i spend far too much time throwing everything i think of at bugs like i know i'm in trouble when i start going into burp and like using the the hex fields to send yeah. every valid character through as something yeah. like that means I'm probably at a little bit too deep. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but then like I'll more often than not like when things aren't like super obvious, I'll find bugs when I'm not when I'm starting sailing, you know, or equivalent. Mm -hmm. um, like that stepping back for me, anyways, and thinking about how the system works and like you know thinking about the system as a whole often leads to some of the better findings that I've had. Yeah. Um, you know, you're at the end of the day, it's like you're trying to you're trying to outsmart a lot of other people who are thinking about this security and like yeah, you're not you have your own unique perspective, but like that's that's also like something that other people are going to consider potentially. <laughs> it's like yeah. you have to find you have to both find your angle, but then also like um but also like find a way to find something unique. Um hmm. so so on that topic, do you have any like sort of tips that you like to use when so like the way that i'm thinking about this is basically if i was hitting a dead wall or, or mm -hmm. a brick wall oftentimes what i would try and do is figure out like what is the back end running or like how mm -hmm. do how do i identify more parts of this infrastructure do you have any things that you like to do like you know you just like sort of your go-to things that you like to try and throw in there to see if you can figure out more about the stack yeah and like i one of my favorite things to try and do is to try and understand how their development environment works. Like mm -hmm. I'll go and find that development environment, find their origin servers, like see if I can get access to those and poke around and see if things can get reflected into prod or vice versa. Um, just understand more about their deployment environment, but then also like their development environment and even like search on GitHub, for example. Um, for not not for secrets, for, so to speak, but just for like development related things. For data, yeah, yeah for yeah. The knowledge, yeah, just just anything you could find that would like, you know, you find somewhere like on GitHub like a random IP address that happens to be the origin server, and like that, yeah, that can be huge. Like that can be all you need for certain bugs. Yeah, dude. See, I love this so much. This is this is this is great because th listen to the way Sam talked about that. Right? He said, "I, I want I want to learn more about the development environment, so I go and find the dev servers." Right? And and that's not. Sam is not looking at those dev servers as like a separate entity of sorts, right? In this in this whole system, he's looking at it as a part of the whole, right? And you you know you can use that 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 extra piece, right, to give you knowledge about prod, or you can find this little piece of data on GitHub that can when you actually read the source code or you look at the open source libraries that they have that they're no doubt using in their own platform, right? Um, it can give you all the little pieces you need to to get deeper and deeper and deeper that's that's such great advice sam well yeah and that's also been like how you'll find like a lot of shared secrets between development and production and like yeah development will be as locked down and so you just get access to the secrets more often than not you know or yeah. um, you know there's also been bugs where it's like kind of like what you're talking about they're using something open source but that open source library happens to use like a static secret somewhere like yeah that's very common. <laughs> yeah, I actually, oh man, where was it? I saw recently you found something that had a static secret. It was like a, a GitHub uh, security issue that I saw pop up somewhere. I was like, where'd it go, Sam? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, 
I don't I can't remember what I, product it was on, but oh I'll, I'll look it up afterwards okay. and link yeah, it. I, I know exactly what you're um, talking about. I don't recall exactly what it's <laughs> Sam's like, about. yeah, you're going to have to be more specific, Justin. That happens to me every day. Uh, um, no, it's earlier this year, and I just don't recall the product. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, <laughs> no, you're good. Um, yeah, so I guess the last thing that I wanted to kind of talk to you about in sort of the hacker methodology section, um, collaboration, mm -hmm. right? What what role? I mean, obviously we've collaborated together, and you know, collaborating with Justin, special special experience there. Uh, but but talk talk to me about about <laughs> talk to me about about collaboration, how it works in with your methodology, how it motivates you, or how it um, you know makes you perform different in a live hacking event, or even just in a bug bounty context. Yeah, like the people that I collaborate with more often than not, it's like. I don't know. I, I end up putting like higher higher expectations on myself than the other person. That's mm -hmm. probably how to mm -hmm. describe it. Like yeah. I don't want to collaborate unless I know I can give like 110% to that target. I've noticed that you do that. <laughs> I love collaborating <laughs> with you, Sam. <laughs> well, so I, I just I just won't even recommend it. Like if I'm like, I don't know, if I'm like off doing something else, I'll be like, yeah, yeah no, sorry, I just can't. Like yeah. it's not because I don't I, want to collaborate. I really with respect you. that you have that like boundary though. For for me, I have this really bad habit of just saying yes to like everything. Yeah. So so here I am, it's December. I currently have about 15 side projects going on. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be doing three of them today. <laughs> like, yeah, dude, Sam, it seems like you've got some healthy boundaries, man, in place with Bug Bounty, which is cool. It used to and, be less healthy. <laughs> yeah, well, can you talk a little bit about that? Because, you know, to be fair, I, I think we had a conversation about this a little bit. You know, you've been in, you've been in this, uh, you know, uh, tech world a little longer than than some of us hackers have, and you you uh, you <laughs> no, but Relatively. I mean, you've you've told me some you you've told me some stuff that I you know. That I appreciated, and that that you know you've learned from from the the wisdom of being in the industry for a little bit longer. How have you, I guess, gotten bug bounty to a point where you have a better work life balance with it, and uh, you know a better relationship with bug bounty, and are able to control those sort of obsessive tendencies, right? Because it it doesn't seem like you're you're, and maybe it's it's just by by virtue of the fact that you're not in it every single day because you you know have a full time job and you kind of distance yourself from it in that regard. But um, I know you also have you know a family and that sort of thing, and and you have other responsibilities there. And I'm just wondering how it all gets balanced, or if there's any tips you've learned along the way. I mean, for me, the biggest thing is like I I've stopped I've stopped looking at a lot of random. Programs, I think is probably mm. the best way to describe it. Like I used to, you know, every invite, I used to be like, oh, I'll poke at this. And now it's like, you know, you get that invite and it's like, well, okay, like if I have time for this, you know, or like, um, but then like, I will try and like, when I do choose to do like a live hacking event or like, you know, especially some of the um, like US government related bug bounty stuff, it's like when those come up, it's like, okay, like I'm going to set, uh, make a point to like set time aside for this, like, you know, let let folks in my life know essentially like I'm gonna be yeah. spending these nights like doing this thing and like especially when you're married, yeah. You've got that that level of, you know, communication you've gotta to, gotta to get through or else it's not gonna work. Yeah, yeah. And like you're like I'm gonna work all day and then do this all night. Like you probably yeah. won't see me too much. You yeah, know? exactly. It's yeah. Like, yeah. It, it, it's like that. Or maybe yeah, you shouldn't say it like that. Maybe you should say, "Hey, sweetie, you know, what did you think if I tried to earn a little extra money?" I know you wanted a money? new car, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, right? um, yeah. Uh, and I mean, like, I don't know. You, you, you also, like, I remember the first, the first bounty I got, and this is like the first like hack the Pentagon thing, and it was like one hundred fifty dollars. Mm. I was like, "This is wild!" Like, I've yeah. never seen so much money before in my life. You know, yeah. And now yeah. it's like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, like. I guess I'll respond to this thing because it's going to earn me another $500 or something. Yeah, like that's, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It, you become very, it's both being jaded, but then also like, yeah, disassociating yeah. The, the bug bounty space with the money to some extent. Um, yeah. Which, 100%. Like, I don't know. We're earning good money here. <laughs> At the end of the day, yeah. Like, yeah. You know, we're in, we're in a good position to be able to say no to certain things too, as well. Dude, that's so good. Yeah, like, like, like having the, and I think that's a, a part of the guttural response of you know being successful in in bug bounty in the beginning is like, ah, I just got a bounty. Like maybe I can do this more. And you know, and you're just like sort of constantly chasing that hit of the 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 <laughs> you know of like the bounty, right? It's almost like a gambling mm -hmm. thing, right? And um and but 
once you learn to control that, once you, you know, and I, and I talk about this as a little, a little bit as well Is like, for me, it was a part of an identity thing for me. Like, ah, uh, like I haven't fulfilled my identity that I, that I want, you know, to be who I want to be if I'm not, you know, at the top of the leaderboard every event, you know, that sort of thing. Right. And just kind of redefining that away has helped me um, build some healthy boundaries. And it sounds like for you, you know, saying no to some opportunities, you know, whether it be a private program invite or maybe even a live hacking event that you just, you can't make it work right now. It's not going to be healthy. Saying no to those things have kind of helped you, you build a more healthy relationship with Bug Bounty. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also, I mean, to be fair, one of the benefits of like having a full-time job and kind of doing this like nights and weekends mm -hmm. is like you do, you can just pause. Like there's, yeah. you still have health insurance and I know you've talked about this as well. It's yeah, there are, there are ways around this in the U S um, mm. but like, you know, self health insurance, you still have a paycheck coming in. Like your bills are still paid. Like, yeah. It's good. And that's, it's nice to have that. <laughs> Miss those days. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, to, to a degree it, it, I, I do, you know, and I love the day to day, but for me, you know, as a full-time hunter, what that looks like is like realizing, okay, I don't actually have to be working all the time because mm -hmm. the payoff, you know, the risk is greater and the reward is greater, you know? Um, and so, you know, if I need to take a couple days here and there to like decompress and chill and, you know, not be working constantly, then I, I should be able to do that. But, you know, I'll, I'll let you know when I ever figure, I figure that out. <laughs> um, all right, man. So that was a lot of the hacking methodology stuff. Um, let's, let's jump back and look, look at the career a little bit because, um, you know, this podcast is primarily about bug bounty stuff. Um, and we'll definitely come back to more bug bounty stuff, but I also am the host of this podcast and I have some very, in, I'm very interested in, uh, you know, career development and entrepreneurialism in particular. So I'd really like to talk to you about your career mm -hmm. and then also the whole thing that you did with, um, uh, buffer over dot mm -hmm. run, um, and that whole experience. So, uh, start from wherever you'd like with the career thing. Yeah. I, you know, I was, um, kind of going back a little bit undergrad. I was a computer systems engineering. I think Joel was as well. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, well I was, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Security engine engineering. Yeah, okay. I, I had a security engineering major when, when I went into college. Oh, so, nice. Oh, that's awesome. That's cool. um, yeah. So well, I was I'm just like, going to stop you right okay. there. <laughs> I, no, I didn't uh, to say that without making you sound old. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, well, I was yeah. <laughs> I'm going to stop you right there. So computer engineering versus computer science versus whatever the heck Joel did. Um, <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on that? And what are the ways you think it's impacted your career? I So I actually dual majored with math and I thought I was going to be a cryptographer. Yeah, and I, I found that. that the computers engineering courses were pretty straightforward, and I really struggled with the math courses. So I was mm -hmm. like, well, maybe I should just go and do this computer thing. Yeah. Um, but you know, honestly, I think like really any of these will give you a good background. Um, you know, and I think that that's like learning the fundamentals will get you a lot of the way to being able to like really easily pivot into bug bounty, the bug bounty space if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, like starting bug bounty stuff was less about learning the security side of it and more about learning how Burp Suite worked. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Yeah. I totally see like so many Damn. people who are like technology adjacent who yeah. are like, I don't know how to get started. And it's like, do you see something you don't know what it is? Just look it up and yeah. like yeah. start following every rabbit hole that you see. And that's the best way to get started. Yeah. It's just like, you take one yeah. step and just like slide down the hill. Yeah. And, and, and also, like you said, Sam, you know, but it can also, you see a lot of people that aren't technical, that just know how to use burp suite and know how to find IDORs and know, you know, you have a basic a understanding yeah. Yeah, of how the browser works. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and you'll find your XSSs, your, your IDORs, your C serfs, your, mm -hmm. you know, access control issues. Yeah. And that's more than enough to pay the bills. If you know yeah. those four vuln types, IDOR, XSS, CSERF, access control, or client side implementation of access controls, yeah. I mean, you can make a lot of money. Yeah. And um, another thing that you can do is you can kind of target those as well. So you can like, if you say you work in some industry that's like maybe a little more obscure, and it's, but it's still technology adjacent, you probably have experience interfacing with some software that like most people don't use. And so you mm. could probably find mm. vulnerabilities in that way better than other people can because yeah. you're used to this software. You might even already kind of know a vulnerability and not realize it's a vulnerability. And it's just like, oh yeah, this just kind of like works this way. And it's like, mm. it's probably not supposed to work that way. Um, yeah. So so I'd recommend like if you 
you know, if you have experience with that, with that kind of stuff, like try and see if they have a program or see if they have a security team and, you know, try and find vulnerabilities because that's also a good place to start. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, Sam, for the interruption. I just, oh, no, you know, the, the, the computer science versus computer engineering thing is kind of close to my heart because I, I see, you know, people like um, you and Joel that have a little bit lower level understanding of some of the stuff that I'm missing. Um, and I've had to claw that back, uh, you know, since I've graduated because my CS program was focused entirely on programming. It was like 100% programming. And, and now I'm like, I don't really understand some of this lower level stuff. And I've had to re, you know, gain that knowledge as a, you know, as a professional. Um, so, I, you know, my advice, I guess, to, to people that want to go to college, which is a choice in and of itself, um, <laughs> is, is to go, you know, computer engineering or security engineering, you know, degree to get that lower level aspect. Yeah. And I've always kind of looked at it from like, you don't, what you learn there is almost, to me anyways, it was kind of irrelevant. Um, mm, to mm. what I actually ended up doing, but it was more of the exposure to all these like different technologies, different ways to do things. And then you can mm. then apply that later. Um, like, you know, never in my life will I ever write MIPS assembly again, but I knew how to at some yeah. point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but I mean, that's, this, that's the thing that doesn't make you scared of it though. Right. Like if you, if you talk to a web developer, right. Somebody like, like me years ago, when, whenever I was just writing PHP and, you know, all that sort of thing and talk about like assembly, it's like, ah, you know, that's that weird shit. Like you're, you're like putting stuff in registers and stuff like that. Right. You know, it's like, um, you know, so it, it, it's, it's intimidating. And I think exposure to it is one of the things that, that can help earlier on in your education. You know, you don't need to know how to do everything for your job, right? Because you're going to have to learn a lot of it on, on the job. But mm -hmm. just that base level exposure, I think, is helpful. Yeah, um, and I will say, like, getting... One thing I wish I had taken more of were, like... And I don't really even know if these existed back then, were, like, how to be a software dev type courses. Because mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. that would get you much further today than a lot of the college courses that I took. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, yeah, I mean, if we could switch it, and I'll, I'll trade you the how to, how to be a software dev stuff from my college, and you can yeah. give me like you know OS one hundred and one or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, all right, so so college, um, computer engineering. From there, where'd you go? Yeah, so I went to work at Cisco, and um, I was doing like working on like VPN technology, the um, ASA firewall VPN. Ah, dude, you're the one that wrote all that buggy code I, that's getting no, popped I every... Actually, <laughs> I actually wrote almost, I wrote very minimal amount of code there. You know, a lot of the work I was doing were like integrating new platforms and stuff. Um, yeah. But, uh, no, the, the folks there, I mean, they're, they're brilliant at what they do, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, trying yeah. to make all that work all in a single X, like box is kind of nuts. Um, but somebody there uh, was like, hey, like, you like security, you should go to DEF CON. Mm -hmm. um, and so Classic. I guess actually kind of backing up a little bit even further, which is, this is like dating myself, but like um, I started listening to the Security Now podcast, like right when it first launched. Yeah, dude. Um, was that, and it's Twit, right? Yep. It spun yeah. out of that. And like that to me actually got me interested in a lot of this, um, in this whole world, honestly, because the way that they explained it, especially in the earlier episodes, was like very, very basic. So it went back to fundamentals very well there. Mm. And mm. It, I don't know. I just have a huge amount of respect for them, especially because they're still going, which is just nuts. Yeah, dude. Yeah, <laughs> years later, man. You were a podcast OG because that show's been around for forever. It's like 2004, I want to say. Yeah, I was listening wow. to like I, uh, was it iPod, iPod Mini or something. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like downloading it over. That's amazing. Um, but anyway, sorry. Going back to so I was at Cisco and someone's like, "Hey, you should go to DefCon." And so like I went there and um, I was like, "I have no idea what to do. Like I don't really just want to go to a talk." So I walked mm -hmm. into the, like the puzzle room, and Brett was sitting right there. Ah, really? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> How nuts is that? Zayat, like, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so we ended up like competing for a few years. Like we won a few black badges, which is awesome. Um, yeah. And then he was like, you know, I think I helped him. I don't remember exactly the timeline here, but at some point, I like helped him find like a like a zero day RC in Ruby like a Ruby library. Um, oh my gosh. He's like, hey, you should come to these like live hacking events. Um, and so Heck yeah, you should. <laughs> I went to one of them and like, I was like there, I was like doing really like curl commands and I was like watching everyone use burp and I was like, what is this magic? You know? <laughs> he's using curl, he's hacking it with curl. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, exactly I remember a similar thing. When I started Bugman, I was using like Charles and, yeah. and everybody's <laughs> using this thing called Burp. And I was like, Burp, you guys should try Charles. And they were like, what oh the hell is God. Charles? Like, no. 
Well, it's like I knew exactly what everyone was doing, but I just couldn't keep up with them, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're using curl and, and freaking inspector or dev tools versus burp, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so from there, I was like, you know, I think I actually said to uh, uh, Namsek, was that that mm. event? And I actually said to him, this is back when he worked at Hacker One. Um, mm. I said to him, I was like, I'm going to, like, I'm going to get better at this. I'm going to win one of these events one day. And that was, yeah. That Lo and behold. That, that, <laughs> that was, that was yeah, your superhero you arc. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty much it, to be honest. You know, from there, yeah. it's like I went to work at uh, Akamai, working on, like, some TLS st- uh, software. And then um, I helped start a red team there, kind of, like, part-time with my job. Um, and that really pivoted me further into the, like, security engineering world. Um, and then, yeah, a year and a half ago, I joined Google. I'm nice dude. Sure. Yeah. No, that that's a good that's a good journey. And so the CTF thing, you know, you rolled into DEF CON, you meet you meet Brett, and then you guys just kind of hit it off and start like popping stuff on CTFs. That's th- that's the that's how you got into that space. It wasn't as much CTFs as it was like puzzles, which is like a different world. Okay. Um, but it quickly pivoted into the bug bounty world. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. talk to me about the black badge thing, like that's pretty badass for one and i think you have multiple or one or yeah so our team won two you um, have two yep. so how how did how what, like um, that that's so amazing and how did how did the ctf come about and who was on your team give me the deets it was in retrospect like i don't know it does like doesn't like feel like a real experience mm, <laughs> mm. but like you know we got a team together of like there are 10 to 13 of us mm. and these puzzles were put on by uh uh Lost one zero five seven. Who's like the organizer mm-hmm. at DEF CON, mm-hmm. or was one of the organizers at DEF CON at the time, like making the badges and everything. Mm-hmm. And so he would put together these puzzles as well. And uh, you know, our team would compete against other similarly sized teams, and we'd spend nothing. We'd do nothing else during DEF CON. <laughs> like that was our DEF CON. So it's only DEF CON. Like you, you show up DEF CON yep. the, and you get the info, and then you start hacking. Yeah, I mean, we would wow. we would go as far as like we would actually. Uh, you know, and I think I I have actually gave a I gave a talk on this. Um, part of my TLS recon was scanning the internet for origin origin story of the TLS recon was scanning the internet for secrets before the DEF CON launch. Yeah, before DEF CON launch, like the no week before. No way! You're yeah. trying to like find the the servers in advance of the. Oh my gosh! Yeah, we That's were successful, um, but. Uh, it turns out somebody, so we were monitoring the entire .codes TLD. Yeah. Like everything, yeah, yeah. everything. Yeah. Like every single domain. And somebody somehow, one of the competitor competing teams got wind of this and they put up a fake puzzle. And <laughs> oh, we spent no three way. days solving this. No. And all that stuff no. was, you know, email, email no. lost and say, you've won this. And so we sent him an email and he's like, what the hell? Like this wasn't me. What <laughs> wow. the heck? Yeah. Wow, that is some that is some gray hat shit right there, dude. Yeah, I mean that's it, nuts. It, it certainly it's like, like freaking ARP spoofing people at a live hacking event or something. Jeez. It was three days roughly of our time where we did nothing but solve these puzzles. And like to dude. be fair, it was really well done, but like they were all faked. <laughs> if I was you, I would have been pissed. I mean, we were suppressed by anything else. So we were a little yeah. disappointed, but <laughs> wow, dude, that's crazy, man. What a what a what an experience. Um yeah, those were those were fun days. Um, you know, I think the the puzzle's still around. I'm not quite sure if it's still a black badge or not. Um, mm. You know, I've kind of I've drifted a little bit. DefCon for me has become more of like a volunteering thing than a you know participation thing. But right, right. No, that that makes sense. Um, so we'll come back to some other career stuff. But you mentioned the TLS scanning thing. Mm-hmm. Talk to me a little bit about bufferover.run. Um, both DNS dot and TLS dot, and uh, tell me tell me a little bit about that project and how it ended up. Yeah, so the the DNS dot endpoint was just I would take the these are all just like honestly these are all just engineering efforts. Like, okay, let me let, let me also just add, add a little bit. Yeah. So Sam ran a service um, yep. DNS dot buffer dot uh, buffer over dot run and TLS dot buffer over dot run. Um, <clears throat> these were tools that you could use for reconnaissance. So you're saying DNS dot is an endpoint where Yes, yeah, so they're both free. Um yeah. you know the the DNS endpoint it um oh, sorry I just gotta something just dropped. Who knows what that was? Um, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so the so the DNS endpoint uh was one where um I would take the rapid seven public data 
and I would just index it and make it searchable mm. because yeah. the Rapid7, it was like this project sonar data at the time was publicly available, but yeah. you would just get these like, you know, it was like seven gig downloads or something absurd. And they would be published like very often, um, I think like weekly. And it was just like what's on the internet essentially. Mm. And so I think that they had like hooks into a bunch of DNS infrastructure and then they just make it available. Awesome. Which was great. And then they realized that they could charge for it and they started charging for it. Did they yank it? Yeah. Oh yeah, they yanked it. No. I don't think it's free anymore. Oh my gosh, I haven't looked into that in so long. It's been years. Okay. Yeah, like two or three years now. No, it says that you can still get the data. I you might have to register it, for yeah, it. But... I think it requires registration at least. I oh no, it's it... actually yeah, it's 47, 74 terabytes of data. You can still get all the moly. all the stuff. It was last updated uh, as early as today. Oh, interesting. Okay, sorry. Existing open data users can sign in for access. It says. Yeah, I think you're right, Sam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you got to sign up for and like request access, but after that. Okay. They yeah, they listed all at least. It was no longer publicly available, and if I recall at the time, I felt it was a little bit sketchy, like rehosting something that you had to get through yeah. the registration. Oh, that's probably oh, yeah. that makes probably sense. part of why they <laughs> why they yeah. did it. Yeah. They're like, hey, this guy's making it accessible. Interestingly yeah. <laughs> enough, someone is constantly pulling this down. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, but I mean, to be fair, no, I was only doing it like once a week. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I had a little like. Uh, uh, I don't know how to call it. Cron job or whatever. No, it was the smallest VPS I could possibly buy. I it was some one of those like European VPS hosters that was like, mm, mm. you know, like two euros a month. Like, mm. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, there was, I don't recall exactly which hosting provider it was, but they were European. And yeah, for whatever reason, it was just enough power to run this web server. It was running at like 70% CPU, like oh, a of the time, but it stayed up. <laughs> So it stayed up question mark yeah and then and then after you so w what you did with dns grep was you took that whole data set extracted yeah. it down a little bit sorted it yes. so it'd be really easy to in you know jump through the indexes and then um and then you made it you know exposed an http api for that right yeah exactly yeah and you could download like good amount of data like hundreds of megabytes ish or so at a time if you wanted to from that endpoint Nice. Um, and I actually ended up putting, uh, at the time, Cloudflare in front of it just because, like, I would get, like, 90 95% offload because everyone's searching for, like, oh Yahoo.com. Like, yeah, you know, oh, yeah, 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 of course. Like, everyone's yeah, searching yeah. the same thing. It was a recon pipeline. So I was like, all right, I'll just put Cloudflare in front of it. And they offload, like, an abs like just an absurd amount of data for That's me. That's amazing. Was there a lot of people who were, like, hitting you as well, like, hitting your APIs, essentially, and, like, done the same thing where they were, like, now taking all of your data and farming it into, <laughs> into their oh, own systems? Or... Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second with the TLS endpoint because that one was much worse, honestly. So with the TLS endpoint, I um, I implemented a system where I was like, uh, without I don't, don't know how much detail I should get into here without like, and I'll explain why in a second I guess. Um, uh, but I was scanning the the public internet for TLS certs, and I used to like you know uh, I have a, a lot of TLS backgrounds, so I used like every trick I could think of to make it as fast as possible. Um, I wrote my own like. Well, modified an existing TLS library to make it work. Oh my um, god, Sam, what is wrong with you? you know, normal things that everybody does. Well, that yeah. made it, honestly, though, that made it affordable. That made it so that I could afford <laughs> That's to run awesome. this, you know? Dude, the amount so, of time you spent rewriting that TLS library cost you more than that freaking compute power <laughs> ever would. Uh, I don't know. I was, I was scanning the entire internet for like 20 bucks a month. Hey, man, have like, you seen nothing. the cost of EC2? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Sam Herb. Okay, so you you rewrote a TLS. Library. Did you write this whole thing in in Go or C? No, it was or all Go. What? Yeah, it was all Go. Yeah, okay, yeah. it was all Go. Gotcha. Um, and so just just as quick as I possibly could, you know. Um, and that honestly that made it affordable for me to run this. And then similar hosting structure where like a teeny server like with Cloudflare in front of it. And um, so I was uh. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. No, no, <laughs> you're good. So, so you built up, you built up that that extra, you know, fast TLS scanning. You're yep. pumping that into a database, and then and then serving that via the API, so people can query against TLS certificates that are popping up over the public internet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. And so, like this for me, anyways, this data was very valuable because, like, you know, there's exposed origins all over the place. Um, yeah. You know, there's a lot of like 
endpoints without DNS routing necessarily, or like internal mm -hmm. DNS routing that you'll find yeah. valid TLS certs for. And, you know, especially I wasn't valid any of the TLS certs. So mm -hmm. there was, um, there were a lot of like self-signed stuff, stuff or whatever. Right term, sorry. Yeah. Self-signed yeah. certs that exist on the internet for like dev instances of things. And, you know, finding all those is extremely valuable. And like, yeah, as a bug bounty hunter. and like that led to a lot of bugs, like a significant number of my finds for years, honestly. Wow. And so I then realized as I was like running this, I eventually realized that folks were using this data and reselling it. Like I essentially put up like a, you know, a rough terms of service and every request down, response downloaded. I was like, like, please don't resell this. Yeah. Um, essentially yeah. it's all sold. Like don't, don't do legal things with this and don't resell it. And I found a bunch of folks who were selling it. I think like three or four different companies and like, Oh man. Super interesting. Up, how did, how did you find that they were reselling it? Um, a couple of cases, someone reached out to me and then a couple other cases, like it was just like somebody posted like, oh, like look at all this data and like, and it listed their sources and it's like Buffer Overrun was one of their sources. Like, <laughs> you oh, should have just put like Sam Irby is, is yeah. amazing dot example dot com <laughs> in all your data sets and then just start looking and seeing if any of them have yeah. it in there. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there's, uh, there's, you know, a lot of less ethical things I could have done with that, like embedding yeah. fake IP addresses in there, but yeah. I didn't, it just didn't seem like the right thing to do. Like uh, even calling somebody out, it's like a lot of these were like startups and stuff and they might not even know yeah. better. Um, or like the other thing too, is like in a lot of cases, these are in other countries, so there's no legal recourse. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. so long story short, I was like, okay, I'm going to go like uh, route three, which is, well, I guess route four, which shut this all down. <laughs> route three was, uh, turns into like a real product. Yeah. And so, um, I spent, you know, I, I finally spent a little bit of AWS budget. <laughs> I think I was spending like, uh, probably like a few hundred bucks a month on AWS and like mm, turned this mm. into like a whole real pipeline. Like everything was much yeah. faster. It was getting the internet way faster. And then I used a rapid API to actually turn this into like a productionized API endpoint. And yeah, it turns out like a bunch of companies then immediately signed up for it. So like uh, data, data reselling companies, you know, immediately signed up for it at like an enterprise level. So there mm. were, there was actually interest in this. Um, How much were you charging? Uh, the enterprise tier was only like 250 a month. I, yeah, <laughs> underpriced that one a little bit, didn't little you, bit, Sam? A little bit, um, <laughs> but still, like that's still like yeah. pretty good, right? Like yeah. I think, like again, we're we're a little like jaded and abstract here, but two hundred fifty dollars a yeah. month per customer is like pretty solid. No, it, like, it is good. Yeah. It is good. Not to not to diminish that at all, but like, but you know, they're, yeah, they're but definitely... again, like right on the scale of like enterprise applications, mm -hmm. I mean, people charge two hundred fifty thousand a month, but it's just yeah, like you know, yeah, like it's crazy. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So from there, uh, you know, I brought in a few customers, but like. I also deployed some much bigger scanning servers. There's a there there's a web host that exists that will sell you bare metal servers that it, uh, they don't. It's not that they don't care what you do with them. It's that <laughs> they, that's a good um, way to preface it. Don't say it like that. <laughs> yeah. It's that they're very scanner friendly. Um, they're kind of known gotcha. as like a scanning friendly host. Um, sure. <laughs> they're yeah they're. Yeah, I've got a host like that too. It's it, they're yeah. located in Sweden. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're like a US. I don't, I don't fully understand how they operate. Um, to be blunt, uh, so yeah. I don't name them. But uh, like, well, hey, man, you know, port scanning isn't legal. I don't, I don't understand why everyone freaks out. But like, port scanning is legal. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah, port yeah, scanning is totally legal. You know, I, I just, yeah, I don't. Maybe they just send their abuse emails to, you know, to the yeah. Avoid. yeah. <laughs> Know, whatever they do about it. Um, you know, I was paying them like $500 a month for like a, a mm. bare metal server um, to scan yeah. much faster. So I was getting results on the entire internet in 24 hours and certain subsets of it in like an hour to 20 minutes. Depending uh, on that's great. The day. That's fast. Yeah. So it was like almost instantaneous. Like I would see hosts yeah. pop up. Um, and yeah, I mean, that to me was extremely valuable. But then, uh, yeah, the both getting this job, but then also um, the like support of all the infrastructure mm -hmm. became a little bit much. So I, uh, I reached out over to a friend who was at the time over at um, Record Future, mm -hmm. um, and they ended up uh, purchasing the whole thing. Nice, um, pretty yeah. cool. It was it wasn't like amazing money, but it's still good money. So I was very happy to hand it off to them. <laughs> very good yeah. man. 
Yeah, no, it's cool to to. It's definitely on my bucket list to do like some little little project like that, turn it into like the software as a service, and then you know eventually exit it. So that that's yeah. a, I, I love to hear people doing that. What what year was it when you exited? Do you know? Oh, this is last year. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it was around the time I joined Google. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Awesome. Yeah, that's um, really really interesting. So, final little section we had here was just talking about Google and uh, your experience there and the whole um, you know program that you guys have in place. Um, so, talk to me a little bit about your current role at Google and your involvement with the bug bounty side of it. Yeah, so um, I my time at Google split between the, the bug bounty program and then um, uh, what we refer to as like kind of like product security reviews. Um, mm. So, you know, looking at signs or things about to launch for their security, um, you know, making sure it's good to go or answering any questions that the team might, teams might have. Uh, but then the bug bounty side, um, I am part of the so. I guess backing up, the way that our bug bounty uh, program works is like our, uh, the, at least on the Google bug bounty program, um, we have a rotation of bug hunters or, or um, security engineers, sorry, who will accept reports from bug hunters and uh, mm. we'll, we'll, we'll treat us on like a weekly basis. Um, mm. And then uh, we we essentially take turns as treasure <laughs> for the week. Mm. Um, mm. You know, I think that this, and so, Sorry, to answer your question, I'm, I'm on that rotation, but then I also help out on the, um, you know, on the help with the overall program, help to try and make it better. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's gotta be interesting, man, being on the, on the triage side, especially for, you know, an attack surface as big as Google, like that's yeah. gotta be nuts. Before you started like working at Google, or I guess maybe the same thing but before you were in the rotation before you started working there whatever had you hacked on google at all like did you have any precursor knowledge about like what vulnerabilities looked like what the infrastructure was like anything like that um yes and no to some extent uh like i had found um some bugs in chrome actually <laughs> okay um, yeah i get okay. it no big deal all right <laughs> <laughs> off to the side like yeah, yeah just a couple Couple chromium bugs, you know. Uh, but I didn't actually. I don't think I had. I have to look through my email. I don't think I actually had any on Google proper because, like, mm. the minimization actually really slowed me down. We actually just released a uh, burp extension that will do proto decompiling for you. Yeah, dude, I freaking love that. Uh, the, yeah, that's the, awesome. I'm, we mentioned it on the pod a couple weeks back when it first <laughs> came out, um, and I was like, "Dang, there goes my moat," because uh, Lupin <laughs> and I sort of like, you know built that exact same tool except it's not as good as yours uh you know a couple weeks back when we were hacking on bard um and so yeah no i was glad to see that drop though because that really opens accessibility up a lot yeah that was that was really my what was holding me back anyways when i was looking at google originally mm -hmm. um you know i think like honestly being on the being on the triage team like you really do see see just how many different services we have um yeah, yeah we get we have bugs from everywhere place, yeah <laughs> yeah can, can so, so you now... talk a little bit uh sorry real quick joel um can, can you talk a little bit about that extension and like like were you writing it i know i know you're one of the collab collaborators on the but like were you what like the one hands on the keyboard writing it and could you talk a little bit about the the structure that google uses in their request that makes it kind of tricky yeah, um, so uh, that extension was actually authored by a uh, intern we had over the summer. Oh, great! Uh, so oh, that's we're, just, awesome. we're just getting around to release it now. Or, or what a cool, what a cool itself, project! But, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think it, it worked out really well. We actually ended up. Um, it turns out that somebody uh, or the the Protobuf team actually had released a tool called uh, Protoscope, I believe it was mm -hmm. called, um, yep. that kind of did exactly what we needed, and so we kind of just glued the. Ex Chrome, the, the burp extension bits uh, onto that. Um, and it actually ended up working out really well. Nice. Um, yeah, that's cool. But uh, the reason that it's so complicated, well, the reason that protobufs are complicated um, is that you don't necessarily know the definition going over the wire. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. And so the when the JavaScript gets compiled, it knows the definition, but the minified JavaScript, you're not given the definition of the protobuf. And that can make... Um, Request and request and response manipulation very difficult uh, in websites that use it. Right. Yeah. And I, what I had noticed, what, like 
there were maybe two websites that I really were like my go-tos that were able to do essentially this, like the proto, mm -hmm. like taking so just like a hex or a base 64 blob of proto buff data and just saying like, here's what the, the type structure looks like. Here's what the, the field indexes are. Good luck. Um, you know, and it's awesome that this is now like an official tool and a CLI tool and now also a burp extension so that you can sort of tie this into all your own tooling and all that, all that other good fun stuff and uh, sort of lower that that bar for, for hacking on Google, which is so super, super awesome to see. Mm. Yeah, there's also a few others in there also, like if there's something that the extension can't do, you know, there are there are a few other options listed. Um, you know, there were definitely, uh, we definitely looked at those um, as we were as we were implementing this, um, you know, for like, just to both, both to just see how they worked, but then also to, um, uh, we want to we want to provide that list just to give folks a choice, <laughs> yeah. right? So so with the extension that that Lupin built uh, and that we were using uh, on Bard, um, essentially it would kind of do some deobfuscation and like you know formatting and that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, you're still not getting like parameter names and stuff like that. You're still you're just getting yeah. like okay, here's an array. You know we know right. that this is like you know a string. You know yeah. <laughs> like and like that for sort protobuf, like the parameter names are completely like decorative. Like it, 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 like yeah. structurally wise, like all it cares about is what what is the index like the field ID number and what type is it. And mm -hmm. beyond that, like you could name it whatever you want. It's really just like, you know, extra. Okay. So, so for you, those of you with, cause I hacked on Bard for like a week. So I've got a very rudimentary understanding of it, but the, the, um, the part of the reversing process then becomes, okay, what is this? Yeah. I, what the heck is this thing? Right. <laughs> yeah. Like, like there, cause yeah, there's this no request now names. added field 19. What is field yeah. 19? Where does this come from? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. So, so you're you're really you're spending a, you're much more blind. You're you're trying to sort of create um, deductions about how the request is actually being formatted and what you know n numeric ID is being used where, what string is being used where. Um, any any tips or thoughts for that, or is it really you just gotta you know we're getting a little bit closer to. Um, a little bit more difficult hacking where you're just sitting there and just trying to make sense of even what you're seeing, let alone trying to figure out how the back end works. Um, I mean, the, the if you see, uh, you know, the, the one tip I'll give actually is like, if you see missing fields, try and putting something in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so it's like stuff that's out of order. Well, you'll get stuff out of order, but you also get field numbering when you, um, when you decompile and recompile it. And mm -hmm. so, like, I don't know if you have like fields like one, two, and five. Like, what are three and yeah, four? Three and four. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Because, because you know, uh, also one of the problems I ran into was that it it doesn't give verbose errors ever, right? So it's like mm -hmm. error five, and I'm like, <laughs> no, <laughs> and I'm like not error five again, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so it's good to hear that, like, actually, just you know, trying to insert stuff at different indexes may actually do something, um, because you know, it could in my in my head, you know, I was thinking that they probably have something very specific they're looking for, and if I just if I do anything besides like change the ID numbers or you know anything like that, it's gonna heck everything up. Yeah, I mean, it really you know it depends on the application. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Dang it! Yeah. <laughs> I was. I wanted the. I wanted the silver bullet, Sam. Like, <laughs> yeah, it, man. become a Google employee and read the protobufs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sam's like, yeah, dude. I don't have to deal with this shit. I got the proto files. You know, like I got the. I got the definitions on this side. We have hired Bug Hunter before. I think uh, Ezekiel, who's who's won a bunch of the, the cloud awards. We, we hired him. Very cool. Yeah, nice. we'll, we'll have That's to chat awesome. about that after. Um, so. I guess so. You know, you're on the triage team. You see a lot of a lot of bugs coming through there. Um, any crazy stories? Any crazy stories you want to share? Or are we diving too deep into the the unknown of the things that we're not allowed to probe about? So. Well, so this is like this is the interesting part is that I can't talk about these bugs, but mm. as bug reporters, we don't hold folks to NDAs. So you're mm. welcome to talk about your bugs, like active bugs. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy, man. That's that's kind of nuts. Um, I, I've heard that before. If you like, say you're going to disclose, we'll send you yeah. a standardized disclosure notice. I'm not going to attempt okay. to paraphrase it, but um, 
yeah, we're not going to hold you to NDAs. Wow, that's really that's cool. really cool. Yeah, um, is that, so that's, that's a, one of the few programs out there that really like actually lets you do that pretty freely because almost every other big program is like, all right, if you want to get paid for it, then mom's yeah. the word, you know? Well, yeah, well, also, I mean, if you write blog posts about it too, like we'll like retweet it and stuff. And <laughs> oh, wow, that's clutch. Um, <laughs> They're even going to promote it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, we want we want more folks finding bugs and yeah. Uh, but uh, I will say actually one of the, one of the more interesting parts that came through, um, and so, sorry, backing up, I guess. Um, mm. So the, I don't know if you've paid attention recently, but like the, over the past year, I guess, we've, we've lost Probably a, not. <laughs> we've lost a lot of, uh, fair. We've lost <laughs> a bunch of different um, uh, kind of, uh, different bug bounty programs is the best way to describe them within Google. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that because there's like, you know, the the one where it's like you get a bunch of, uh, you know, any app above 100 million, you know, installs, that's in scope for Google, the Google mm -hmm. Play, you know, thing. And there's yep. the VRP and then there's some AI stuff. So like there's a bunch going on. Well, so the one in particular that I want to call out is um, the abuse VRP. And this is something mm. that like I didn't, before joining, I didn't have a lot of insight into. Mm. Um, and it's actually really interesting. So like when we are... Um, when we are like rewarding payments through the Google VRP, we'll actually at the same time do the abuse VRP because hmm. often there are there are bugs where it's applicable to both and we'll just like reward whichever one's highest. What is the abuse VRP? Yeah, I was going like, to say like what falls under. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So to use the example, um, recently somebody reported that uh, they received like a really convincing phishing email that, um, and this is like uh, this, they actually wrote about this publicly so I can talk about it. Um, it, it became a problem with the BIMI protocol. Um, and it's some sort of like email, I, I, this is pushing the limits of what I uh, mm. know about this, but um, it's some sort of uh, email user identification system. Oh, no, I'm really, I've never even heard of this. Brand this uh, brand indicators for message identification. It's, it's kind of like SPF for DKIM or um, DMARC or one of those like, I guess it's just an additional sort of security layer Brand and their, their what? additional Sorry? DNS, uh, BIMI, brand, uh, brand, what was it? Brand uh, indicators for message identification. Wow, interesting. And so somebody reported a problem that they like received like a really convincing phishing email through this. Um, and like, that's not, you know, phishing emails don't like quite fit cleanly under the rules of our VRP necessarily. Mm -hmm. and But under the abuse VRP, like this is like a very clear cut, like this can be used to abuse our products. And so um, like we accepted through that, but then like, you know, I think that actually resulted in like RFC updates. Like they wow. they weren't they weren't aware that this could be an attack. I don't recall the exact details, but it did, it did get some news back uh, a few months right. ago. So it sounds uh, like but, kind of the distinction is like more like Re repurposing intended functionality or at least like featured t functionality for like a bad purpose versus something that's like a security vulnerability. And maybe they kind of like overlap a little bit, but like one is more like classical than the other. Is that is that kind of the gist? Exactly, yeah. I think that's the right way to look at it. Like, you know, like there's there's things that are cleanly technical security vulnerabilities, like NRC would be a clean security vulnerability or like uh, clean abuse, like you can, I don't know like steal money from somebody. <laughs> yeah, let me let me let me read this really quickly. It says, "Okay, note in addition, significant abuse related methodologies are also in scope for this program. If the reported attack scenario displays a design or implementation issue in Google products that could lead to significant harm. An example of a, an abuse related methodology would be a technique by which an attacker is able to manipulate the rating score of a listing on Google Maps by submitting a sufficiently large volume of fake reviews that go undetected by our abuse system." Mm. That's really cool. Super cool. Yeah, and so we get we get a lot of reports where like, you know, we forward it to that team. <laughs> yeah, I imagine uh, so. So. <laughs> so. So I wanted to ask, like, because Google is so huge, and you guys probably receive a lot of reports. Um, how do you go sort of about like drawing the line for like this is stuff we don't care about? Because I can imagine that there you can you can, you know, rework all your bugs in one way or another and make it so that like technically it falls under some form of either abuse or technical security issue. And how do you mm. stop like that from overloading the inter internal teams with like lots of little nitpicky things that don't really like that 
that maybe they should fix, but it not doesn't need to happen tomorrow, right? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of automation on our side that helps us, that, especially with that first level of like, look at the report, like, do we even own this URL? <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Yeah, are... actually, I got a, I got, when I submitted a bug, it's like, I got an email back saying, hey, uh, by Google Magic, we yeah, know, so this our, is like within like yeah. two minutes of me submitting the bug, it's like, by Google Magic, we know that this is a valid report. Or like something like that. Oh, "Oh, wow. That's kind of crazy. Like (laughs) we we do have a, I need some um, of that magic. Yeah, (laughs) seriously. Uh, so I should preface this by saying, well, I should preface this by saying that security engineers will still look at every report. Um, Yeah. That really impacts the order with what's true look at things. Uh, but we do have like a first pass, like machine learning, uh, system that will look at every report and knows what's previously been valid and invalid. Um, I should also say, just before I go any further, that like anything I say here, the rules pages take precedent um, in case I make any mistakes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair. That's um, fair. You know, if you go under the Sam, you website, said on the CTPV yeah, podcast um, yeah. that <laughs> I could submit phishing emails. Uh, <laughs> uh, but then, so then if you go to on the bug hunters website, if you go under um, the invalid reports section, um, yeah, there are a few a few different categories there, which actually often will catch folks off guard. Mm. Um, the one big one, especially, is uh, um, open redirects. Like, there's a yeah. few cases where we have intentional open redirects that uh, do have security properties. Slash but, AMP. Yeah, um, those are those are intentional, um, and we often get reports around those. I I uh, I saw a tweet a while back that was like, "Hey, I can only you know I'm trying to get this open redirect to work, but I can only redirect to like the site in Google.com." And I was like, "Ah, you're in luck because slash AMP, you hit slash AMP with that open redirect, and it'll." Uh, you know, redirect you to whatever domain you want. Um, and, you know, that's that's just a, a gadget that's been in place for a while. And this is just a comment on a, you know, on a Twitter response. And everyone was like, like, retweet. Like, you know, like, I spend so much time, like, writing, like, very thoroughly thought through single, tweet single threads. Line comment. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very, very thorough responses. And then this one just, like, blows up because Google's got an open redirect they won't fix. It's like, come on. I would, wouldn't say won't fix. I would look on the about page to understand more of our logic. No, behind. yeah, let, let me be clear. I don't think it's a problem. I don't think it's a problem because Google, you know, well, I, I, I guess let me, let me, let me challenge that a little bit. I think it is, I don't have all the context in your organization. I think it's a little bit irresponsible to, to do something like that. Um, because I use open redirects in chains like every day, you know? Um, and so ideally that would be fixed. But the thing is, Google is a, is a, you know, a search engine and the, the a part of the business case is redirecting users, you know, to things. So um, I'm sure there's a perfectly valid, you know, use case for it on your side. But I will say I've used that redirecting chains many times. I will say also the, that there are, and once again, like look at the invalid reports mm-hmm. redirect page for a lot more technical mm-hmm. information around this. I probably should have read it before I joined this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I have it open. I'll, 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 we'll put a link down below. Okay, yeah, cool. yeah, we'll drop um, it. There are a lot of cases where we do accept those. Um, oh, really? Interesting. You know, there's like, you know, JavaScript redirects, obviously. Um, yeah. But like ones that aren't intentional might get rewarded. <laughs> mm, interesting. Um, and I look at that page once again. Okay. All right. Yeah, we'll, we'll add it. Um, yeah, JavaScript redirects, client-side redirects. We've talked about this plenty of times on the pod, but um, there there is a lot of use cases with that, especially with the, with the onset of um, uh, same site cookies and just whether or not things are going to be sent cookies depending on where the request originated from. And when you do a client-side redirect via JavaScript, you, um, you really, you know, you're sending different cookies along if you had just done it from a third party uh, top level nav. So- Well, actually, I know, sorry, I mean like a little bit more like uh, open redirect across that scripting, but. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Open redirect to cross site scripting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's interesting. You know, JavaScript level redirects. I think that I'd be surprised if you guys accepted those, but I I also wouldn't be surprised in that there. I think. Yeah. I as, actually sorry. I don't know if we accept those. I really I really didn't okay. mean the the you know the JavaScript URI like the. Oh, the redirect to yeah sure. Sorry. Client side redirect yeah. and where you can snag it via cross site scripting. Yeah. yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, well, that's cool, man. Yeah, there's a lot of different. There's a lot of. I'm on the, the page for I guess bughunters.google.com, and there's a ton of different uh, programs here on the left hand side 
Android and Google device security reward program, all the way to Alphabet program, to open source, to OS Fuzz or OSS Fuzz. So like, there's a ton of stuff here. Um, so that's a big job you got going on there, Sam. Because got to keep gotta, you busy. We have a large team, and like we want to, we want to reward good vulnerabilities. Um, you know, I think that if you want to see some other cool ones, some of my favorites have been on the um, the there's yearly there in the past years have been cloud uh, cloud rewards for like the best GCP uh, ah, vulnerabilities. GCP stuff. Nice. Um, mm. You know, those are always like super creative. Um, um, there have been some great write-ups there as well. Very nice. Um, you added something to the doc here, hacking Google, and it's like a like it's it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen, to be honest. Like I I uh, I, I mean, love seeing brands not, embrace hacking like this. By the dude, way, this was not yeah. on my radar at all, and we're gonna link this down below. But it, it, apparently, it's like a you know a multi series, uh, almost like a documentary of like essentially hacks that have happened with Google, you know, and and uh, hacking related stuff at Google. Um, super well produced. Yeah, they went all out with this. Talk, talk to me about that. I mean, and it's only a year old, and there's like millions and millions and millions of views on it. Yeah, um, yeah. This, I probably can best describe this as like this is what I show my grandparents to, to them what I do. <laughs> um, that's like, it, it that's awesome. To, <laughs> it tries to put into like you know into something that's publicly consumable, like you know by everybody. Like what what we do as security engineers. Yeah, um, you know, it talks about a bunch of different teams. Um, the one that I linked to there is uh, the one on our uh, bug bounty team. Mm, yeah, is that the? Let me see, episode four. Episode yeah, four. Because because I only I only got through some of them. Yeah, episode episode yeah, four. That was the one, one I clicked. Is wild. I yeah, it's really well done. Uh, it's uh, I, I really like that series. <laughs> yeah, the first one, uh, Operation. Aurora, I, I I watched that one. And I was like, this is amazing. And then I clicked right on the Bug Hunters one, and then I realized oh, I got to go record the podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so no, that's great. I'm gonna go back and check that out. Also, they've got a Project Zero section as well, which mm -hmm. is such a cool um, part of Google. Um, so definitely definitely check out the uh, Hacking Google series. Um, Dude, I think that we're already at an hour thirty. That kind of oh, concludes geez, yeah. what I had on the uh, on the list here. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to shout out or talk about uh, before we we wrap the pod? No, uh, thank you for having, thank you all for having me on here. You know, this was yeah. a great experience. Of course, man. Yeah, uh, you can find absolutely. Sam on on Twitter, Irby Sam. <laughs> and I don't know, do you even use your LinkedIn? I've got it here, but uh, no, no, he doesn't no. even use LinkedIn. So just find him on Twitter <laughs> yeah. uh, or X, Irby Sam with two V's. Um, Sam, thanks for coming on and sharing your knowledge, man. And uh, looking forward to our next uh, collab where you give it 110%. And, yeah. uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> all right, man. Awesome. Talk to you soon. Peace. Peace. All right, all right. I, I ended the podcast before <laughs> Sam talked to us about cool bugs. So I mentioned um, on the Sam Old podcast a while back that uh, Sam was one of the first people that introduced me to XSLT. Um, and so, Sam, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about that bug and, yeah, just kind of talk to us about that. Yeah, so this was at, well, this is like one of the first life hacking events I attended. And uh, there was this endpoint that accepted, um, it was XML, but it wasn't XML, it's XSLT, which is like a data transformation language. I, I don't... Okay, so it accepted uh, XSLT directly. Yes, um, but it, oh. it would accept, like, it was like, you'd accept, like, your your input and then the XSLT to, to transform it with. Um, and so it's oh, one of those, okay. like, uh, business logic type languages that, like, well, I'm probably butchering this for XSLT experts, um, but it's one of those business logic type languages that allow you to transform data kind of arbitrarily in, like, uh, a user-friendly way. Like, you know, somebody who can write an Excel document can go and write this XML format. Um, and so apparently afterwards I found out, like actually a lot of folks, other folks at this live hacking event found this endpoint and just kind of did a simple like XSC payload and kind of called it a day. Um, yep. I decided to spend a bunch of extra hours digging into this. Classic, um, classic Sam. So what I actually ended up doing was like, I actually went to the function reference and I stepped through every function uh, I'm so, yeah, hold, hold up. What? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so, so you, you, did you take up like, did you somehow leak the library name and then set up your own local instance and then hook up a debugger? I mean, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, what did we do there? Yes. <laughs> I think it was open source. To be fair. I think it was open source. So He's I'm pretty sure yes? I set my own instance of this uh, oh my just to gosh. test it out. Um, 
But then like I also I just wanna I just wanna highlight how Sam was like, Yeah, so anyway, I thought this was interesting. So I just, you know, uh, put a uh, breakpoint on the debug. I was like, What? Yeah, so, like, I mean to be fair, okay. like, this is many hours in after trying many different things. Like there's like a, there's there are a fair number of public XSLT exploits and like this seemed to be fairly patched. Um, yeah. so I did so yeah, I, if I recall correctly, I did set up my own instance and this was like 2019. No, this is even earlier. This would have been 2018 or 2017. Um, and yeah, I just stepped through every function, saw what it did. And then I eventually realized that like you could string like two or three of these functions together to get like a really cool um, uh, LFI gadget. And I believe I also had an RC gadget in there as well. Yes, um, you did. But I just remember that because like I was like, there were some limitations around it. Like it was, there was a couple, I don't recall exactly what the limitation was, but like I kept trying to exploit it further and I couldn't, like maybe I couldn't like pivot to root or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I actually gave a presentation at Lifehacking event afterwards, like showing this off, which is probably where you remember it from. Yes, and I was like, right. oh yeah, you know, I'm like really disappointed in this bug. You know, I thought I could take it further. And I, I think it was uh, Doggy G was like, dude, like you still got a crit, like, yeah, come like on. <laughs> <laughs> Chill it out. Like you're just reading, you know, arbitrary files from production on a multi-billion-dollar company. Yeah. Like just, just accept it. Move on. Take, like, take the dub. Yeah, yeah. You know. Like, <laughs> yeah, dude. Uh, XSLT is a really interesting thing that I'm looking forward to diving into a little bit more when I find. Um, I think you know. So like that something that takes it. I'm sorry. Go. No, go go. Oh, go I was gonna say. It, um, there's like this whole class of like business logic languages and things that aren't really ever meant to be exposed to the internet and when they yeah. are result in really scary things and it's like there have been yeah. efforts to lock these down but like often they weren't really ever built to be locked down and so like this they're just going to be they're going to continue to be kind of like a source of vulnerabilities going forward and mm. you know i think that that's a great area for more original research I mean, we even see this with with XML, right? Mm -hmm. Like XML is a data markup language. Like, yeah. why does it have this functionality to like read local files and send HTTP requests, right? Um, right. So, really, it, it is cool. Anytime you see the opportunity to do something like like that, where you're actually parsing some type of code, you know, um, on the server side, big money there. Mm -hmm. Very cool, man. All right. Well, I, I wanted to get that last little explanation in. Hopefully, we didn't lose any viewers at the first uh, at the first false end. But um, thanks for coming on, man, and thanks for sharing about that. Bonus content. <laughs> Sweet. Awesome. Cool. Peace. Peace.